So let's start slowly. First of all, thanks everyone for coming. And yeah, today we're going to talk about why is it important to stay keep curious and especially stay keep curious while you're working at PostgreSQL. But first of all, a bit of background. So yeah, as you may notice from this really weird uh, first slide, I'm working for Zalando. We're doing fashion and so on, but of course we're doing a lot, a lot of cool stuff. And uh, in my team, uh, we're doing something like that. So uh, you may probably know that for, of course, for all of this infrastructure, you need to have a lot of database and 99% of the time it's Postgres in our <coughs> company. And we in our team have to manage all these Postgres infrastructures for all the Postgres databases. And unfortunately, we have to manage all those databases on different environments. So data centers, uh, cloud, Kubernetes, whatever. Maybe you know, maybe you've heard about us uh, because of these two projects, because actually Patroni and Postgres Operator are coming from us. Uh, Patroni, maybe you've heard that super popular, um, super popular high availability solution. And uh, Postgres Operator is just a Kubernetes operator that helps us to run Postgres on top of Kubernetes without, because without it is almost impossible. Yeah, and actually this situation that we have to run Postgres in so many different uh, environments indirectly led me to the idea for this talk. So let me explain. Let's imagine just an abstract situation. We have some database, and then we suddenly want to know what's going on inside. Usually, it's pretty straightforward to have these PG star views. We can get pretty much whatever information we want, how many sequentials, counts, <coughs> just whatever happening. And people are aware about it. They're using it. Everything is perfect. But now, suddenly, people realize, aha, but we're running our database on top of some Linux installation. What do we need? I mean, there is definitely some layer of complexity here. We need to also monitor it somehow. We need to know something about it. So they scratch their head and saying, OK, let's measure something global. Let's measure CPU utilization and I.O. utilization, for example. Good, but OK. And then suddenly they realize that they run not only on top of Linux installation, but they also run within some container, within some C group. And they again stretch in their head, but they're still, it's here to already at this point, it's not clear what to measure for them. Uh, they've read some blog posts, they've read some documentation, but again, there is no like, you know, practices for databases explicitly what to do here. And then we go even deeper. We realize that we run on, on top of some virtual machine and people are getting completely confused by this point. And then eventually it turns out that this virtual machine just one node on a Kubernetes cluster and people are just lost what to do here. <coughs> and what happened usually, and I've seen it many, many times, uh, at this point, people are saying, okay, we are doing business here, which means we don't have time to spend time on this interesting small issue that we're finding, and we just go and like, forget about them, restart database or whatever. And usually it's really, really bad because people are losing the knowledge they can acquire. Well, first of all, for community, the second one for them or for them all, because this problem most likely will appear anyway in the future, maybe less visible or maybe more visible, and it's definitely not the right approach. Uh, yeah. That's why I created this talk, this idea for this talk. And unfortunately, the plan here is a bit uh, not that there is no structure for this presentation in a sense that in this presentation, I just tried to collect uh, several different case studies uh, as an examples uh, where you have some issues and problem. You need to troubleshoot most likely from performance uh, perspective. And you can't really do this only from the PostgreSQL itself. So you need to employ some different approaches. So yeah. Uh, First of all, let me explain. As I said, we cannot extract sometimes all the information from the Postgres itself. And that's why we need to understand what else can we use for these purposes. And the first one, uh, I would really encourage you, it's a source code. Because I would really encourage you to read the PostgreSQL source code. It's amazingly documented. And for Linux kernel also, I mean, it's a, of course, it's a different beast. But at the same time, uh, almost all the new stuff is also quite well documented. Uh, and the rest of the stuff, if you actually wanted to get some structure for the slides, accidentally these three items are kind of corresponding to the structure. So we're going to talk a bit about how to use simple tools like S-Trace, well, GDB not exactly, but perf profiling. Then we're going to little bit explore what Linux kernel itself provides in terms of these procFS and sysfs and so on. And eventually we're going to talk about a little bit about extended BPF and how to use this in the inf how to use it in the infrastructure. Yeah, and the first case study is really simple, but at the same time annoying. And we've stumbled upon it many, many times, unfortunately. It's this error. Maybe you've seen already that before when we cannot resize shared memory segment. And it's really stupid, and the problem is, since it's an issue, it's like an error, you cannot really troubleshoot it from the Postgres itself. So what you can do about this, pretty simple. You can take a trace, 
If you're using modern enough version of S Trace, there is a minus K with leap unwind that provides you, I mean, for those of you who don't know, S Trace is a tool that allows you to monitor which exactly your system calls your application is doing. And minus K allows you to show which stack trace led to this particular system call. And if we're going to attach to our Postgres backend that is crashing, we can see nicely that first of all, we're trying indeed to allocate some, to allocate some shared memory, which, is, which was too big and it happens from some parallel execution. And indeed, this error happened to be appearing only on the PostgreSQL 11, when finally parallel worker starts to work properly, and only on big analytical queries. But there is another small thing, why, <laughs> why, why, why we cannot allocate this stuff? Well, obviously, because of something not Postgres related. Docker, by default, limits, unfortunately, dev SHM to 64 megabytes, which, of course, sometimes not enough for big analytical queries. Simple, straightforward tool and simple, straightforward answer for this use case. You may say that it's kind of a hack in the sense that, yeah, of course, it's like a problem error. You cannot um, troubleshoot the problem from the tool itself. So here's another example, more performance related. There is such thing in Linux called virtual data stamp objects. It's basically a nice thing that allows us to make some system calls like get, system, uh, get, get time of day or some other time related calls, system calls, without actually switching to kernel space. Uh, you can imagine that switching to kernel space, of course, is an overhead and switching, if you can avoid this, it's pretty nice. <coughs> and normally it works, especially, uh, except the situation when it doesn't. And you may learn about it, for example, that it turns out that some hypervisors does not support this feature, unfortunately. Uh, most notably, for example, Xen. And if you know that M4 generation of instances and a fourth generation of instances in general in AWS is running on Xen side hypervisor, which means that if you run Postgres there, you're doing a lot, a lot of those queries, like a real system calls, which means that you're getting an overhead. So how can you realize if it's a problem for you or not? Again, super easily. You can take a trace attached to your backend and then see if you're doing this kind of system calls because with virtual data stamp object, you're not going to see them because there is no real system calls happening. So here, how you can, with pretty simple tool, just test trace, reason about performance, and if you want to go into more details, there is a nice blog post about that called Two Frequently Used System Calls Are 77% Slower and blah, 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 and all about this stuff. Okay, and if you happen to see my presentations about this topic before, you maybe know that usually at this point I'm uh, showing this example about CPU migrations and so on, but literally a few days ago I decided that it's too boring, especially in the view that now we have something more interesting and nice to talk about something called memory data sampling vulnerability that happened to be really released just a few days ago. And in fact, Anders Freund already uh, posted really nice analysis of this problem and really nice analysis from the, pers from the performance point of view. You may want to read it in Hackers. But here, I, here I'm mostly repeating after him. But with a different idea, I just wanted to show you that, for example, you have this situation, there is a new CPU-related vulnerability, there is a mitigation from the Linux kernel, and I'm going to show you how you can, re how can you verify on your own whether it impacts your database or not and how much. So for those of you who don't know, that's another uh, CPU vulnerability like the Spectre from the last year and so on. And basically for that, there is of course already a patch for Linux kernel. And of course, this mitigation of this vulnerability, uh, for that mitigation, we have to do a little bit more bookkeeping, which means there is an overhead. How can you figure out how much of this overhead is happening? Here we can deploy something more powerful, perf. So we can try to uh, profile our application, profile our PostgreSQL. And perf provides really nice thing called perf diff. So you can take a perf record from the first old database, from the uh, new one on the new kernel. So here basically, yeah, what I have did, I have compiled, I accidentally have a latest master of Linux kernel. I've, I was running it with these patches uh, inside camera virtualization, QM virtualization, and with Postgres inside. And then you can see if you run Postgres there, you can see that suddenly this call starts to take incredible amount of time, taking into account all the changes is like 25%, so which usually not happens like that. If you want to ask Perf, please tell me what's happening within this system call, uh, within this function, you will see something like that. We will see the instruction called VRVRW, which before was actually used just for verifying some buffer, some, something totally not useful. But with this patch, it actually starts 
starts working in a bit different. So if you're going to update your micro cards for Linux kernel, this instruction will uh, flush your CPU buffers, which means that of course it will incur significant amount of overhead. And we can see that this instruction, it wasn't there before this patch, and we can see clearly why perf div that it's there. And that's exactly how much our application is struggling with performance because of this patch. Uh, you may have to, you need to be aware here significantly about skid because sometimes, unfortunately, perf can uh, attribute this amount of percent to different instructions. Uh, and if you see such situations, you need just to employ precise based uh, profiling. And yeah, another thing you saw before I was repeating after Andres, but now actually the point is that we've stumbled upon this situation in a really unexpected way, even without realizing, even before this vulnerability was uh, published, we realized that in some of our profiles we see that native safe hold takes incredible amount of time, unhealthy amount of time in our profiles. And it was just doesn't make sense why your database is, is doing a bit more job and at the same time it's like waiting for long because this process actually attributes to Swapper, which is basically an idle process in kernel. And of course, here you can deploy another source of uh, truth. It's a Linux kernel. And obviously, with this patch, we can see that this thing is actually being called clear CPU buffers to mitigate this vulnerability again within a native safe hold, of course. So that's if you want to, for example, run your database on top of hypervisor, you may not see this, this uh, instruction directly, but you will see this side effect of this problem in this way. Yeah. Another nice example how you can exploit perf is, for example, huge pages. I've chosen this example as a, this study case uh, just because these huge pages somehow happen to be a relatively a mysterious area. People not always understand how does it work and they're sometimes coming up with some strange theories. And here again, well, we're talking only about classic huge pages to limit this thingy. And here again, we can deploy this first of source of truth. We can go and read documentation. In the documentation of the kernel, it says that huge pages, you can benefit from them because TLB, transaction leukocyte buffers, misses are going to be faster and less frequent. So we have this theory, we have this case study, we have a theory. With huge pages, TLB misses are going to be less frequent. How are we going to prove it in our particular setup? So for example, we have a PostgreSQL and we want to prove that indeed in our case it's like that. Super easy. Here I've provided two experiments. The first one, I was running Postgres with a regular PG bench with a read-write workload. And then I was recording TLB load and store misses. And for the second time, it was totally the same, except that huge pages were turned off. And uh, the memory was not actually that much. It was consuming about 8 gigabytes, but nevertheless, it was enough to see this difference. And here we can see that it's uh, about 90% less for load and 29% for stores misses. Indeed, we have less for uh, huge pages turned on. And from this situation, we can already figure out how much this difference of exactly one parameter affect our latencies, for example, of PG Bench. So it's really a nice um, example because usually what people are doing, they're running PG Bench and then they're comparing some results, but then at the same time, it could be easily that you forgot about something or misconfigured something, which means there's going to be a noise from totally unrelated stuff you want to measure. So in this case, you can measure something explicitly, you can prove it, and then from this you can go on. And another the last example with Perf is about log holder preemption. Uh, the thing is that if you, um, most, of the, most, of, uh, most of us nowadays are running database on top inside some cloud, and it turns out that for clouds, for virtual machines, for hypervisors, there is a such problem called log holder preemption problem. And it's a, such a huge problem that uh, CPU vendors, Intel and AMD, they've created their own solutions on the CPU on hardware level for this problem. So let me show how does it work. What's the, actually the problem? So let's imagine we, want, we have a hypervisor. And then this hypervisor <coughs> exposes four different virtual CPUs. And two of them are right now running, and two of them are just idle. Well, not idle, they're uh, preempted. And now imagine that we are doing some Postgres workload on top of these virtual CPUs. So CPU 1 is doing some real workload, and that happened to be that CPU 2 is waiting on spin log for this particular uh, workload to be, uh, to, be, to be done. So whatever, we need to get transactions committed or something like that. Normally it's not a problem because spin lock or whatever else could be super short and it's not a problem at all, but then it could happen that hypervisor will decide, okay, C1 got enough time, we need to preempt it and get some time to another C4. And what happened to be before totally small amount of time on spin lock, well, happened to be, I don't know, unexpected amount of time and totally more than we expected here. And this problem is, as I said before, big enough so that Intel and AMD CPU, they have this 
functionality called pause loop exiting that will prevent the situation. Uh, so now we have this theory, we have this feature in our CPUs and we want to know how much does it affect our performance on database. Again, we can do this super easily. For that, we have two experiments, again, just a Postgres, just a PG bench with a read while workload, but now we put our database inside a KVM hypervisor. And for the first example, we have default uh, pause, exiting, pause loop exiting feature, so it just turned on with all the default parameters. And what we measure here is measure, we measure how much switches are we doing because of pause instructions. So how frequently this CPU feature actually interrupted our process, our backend. And we see that quite frequently, in fact. And then for the second example, totally the same setup. And we can see that with the only difference is that we turned off this feature completely. And here we can see that we significantly quite visibly reduced our latency. So what happened? The happened is, well, pretty much straightforward. Our CPU was so much utilized in the first case that something, uh, that just a normal legal waiting, the CPU feature considered to be a not normal spin lock waiting and it was uh, preventing <coughs> this waiting. And of course it was a real functional waiting. Uh, every interrupt is an overhead. So we can see in this particular case we've got significant, significant amount of overhead just because of this feature turning off and on. Unfortunately, we can just play with it easily and figure out what is the most convenient setup for us. And now, yeah, uh, the thing is that what I've showed before is basically a stateless measurement. So you can use this stateless measurement on a monitoring, for monitoring or for whatever else basis, but uh, the idea is that you have some event, you've processed this event and that's it. And then there is a nice thingy, nice kind of a buzzword maybe, even if you've heard about this BPF and extended BPF that allows us to do it like black magic. So let me explain. Originally BPF, it's just a functionality in the Linux kernel that was there since 90s or so. And it's a basically a bytecode that you can execute within a kernel. So we see the user space, kernel space, and we can see, we can execute some, some particular, some arbitrary code when something happened within a kernel. For example, originally it's, yeah, BPF is by the way, Berkeley packet filtering. So normally it was used for processing some TCP packages or something. And now after some time it was extended. Now we can not only uh, perform something, now we can perform, and that's why it's called extended BPF, we can save some information in registry, stack, and maps. And what's really, well, it was already before, but what's really black magic here is that we can attach this bytecode to pretty much any function that was not, you know, optimized by compiler or something. So literally to any moving part of Postgres or Linux kernel or whatever, which means that you can literally monitor everything you want. Uh, and let me show a few examples. So for example, we have this tunable in Linux kernel called scheduler wake up granularity. It's basically a parameter that tells you how frequently Linux kernel will try, to, Linux scheduler will try to check your process, uh, um, check the process of your status, like whether it finished or not. And usually it's rather small, of course, here's a default value. Uh, and the point is that there's a theory, okay, we have a parameter in Linux kernel, what happened if we will tune it down or like up or down, doesn't matter. So if we're going to do this with perf, it's possible, but then uh, I would really t advise you to try, uh, just, just for the experience, try to, uh, to record some session for perf or scheduler, and even one second of scheduler events will give you like, I don't know, 100 maybe megabytes of data. It's almost impossible to process it. And with BPF, we can do really nice and crazy stuff. So here's another example, also an experiment. Postgres, PG bench workload, the very same, except one different thing. Now we're doing PG dump in the background. Basically, it's an example of something like a real OLCP workload and then plus something long, long uh, job in the background that happened against this database. And here we can see some amount of time, real time that's spent for this PG dump. So now we see it's about one minute, 38 seconds. And here it's a really nice example that we can uh, extract using extended BPF. It's basically a distribution of how much time do we spend on this particular process without being interrupted by a scheduler or by, a scheduler or by something else. And we can see clearly that here it's pretty much small. So most of the time we're spending about 32 to 63 nanoseconds without being interrupted. Normally for any OLCP workload it's totally fine because all those qu qu queries are rather fast and so on. But then we know that our PG dump is run like for one minute, almost for two, well, one and a half minute. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't matter to interrupt it so frequently. And we want to know how, what, what, what will happen if we will try to change this tunable, but as I said before, to, to, you know, to ping it a little bit less frequently. 
And here's a pretty much the same setup we can see when we adjusted this parameter. And now we can see not just that we reduce this amount of time by like what, six seconds, which may be sometimes important for you if you want to make your pitch them faster and so on, it doesn't matter here. But also we can see the proof that our adjustment was working. Now we can see that time we spend on a CPU without being interrupted is 1000 to 2000 nanoseconds, which is much more, of course. And that's why our PG dump can do a little bit more work. Not like super that much, but significantly in the sense of six seconds and something. And of course, if you're doing a lot, a lot of data, it could be much more. <coughs> yeah, and all this stuff, um, Normally, it's really hard to write BPF programs because it's a bytecode and manually it's almost impossible. It's like, you know, writing uh, Java in uh, JVM bytecode just because you want to do this. Of course, no one is doing this. People are using Java or other languages and that's what pretty much happens here. There is a really nice tool called BCC, BPF Compiler Collection, which basically allows you to write uh, Python code that will generate extended BPF program. And what's even more important, this tool contains a set of tools uh, already interesting created tools for you to measure something interesting. For example, these benchmarks, this diagram uh, was taken by one of these tools just directly out of the box. I wasn't doing anything at all. But then, of course, this uh, collection is pretty much generic and that's why I've created a similar collection for uh, explicitly for measuring some interesting Postgres effects uh, via this approach. So let's take a look. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, for me, it was kind of an interesting, I'm not yet sure because uh, probably it could be convenient if you, for example, want to play with Intel, uh, Intel RDT, like resource di director technology. If you want to, for example, uh, run your database in Kubernetes and then there is one CPU that different small database are running for and you can slice down the cache for the CPU for these different processes so that they're not going to be uh, concurrent. There's not going to be that much of a fight between them. And here, to measure how actually it's going to be important for you, you can run this script that basically will show you how much uh, CPU, less level cache CPU hits you've got per backend. So per backend, in this sense, is really mind-blowing because, of course, you could do the same, very same number before per in general, per Postgres, or like per, uh, well, different backends with process ID, but now you can do this per even just get a query itself, which is really mind-blowing. Or remember this one about shared memory. Using this approach, we can be even more fancy. We can try to uh, break down all different memory, shared memory allocations by different kinds that Postgres is doing. So for example, if we will run this one, we will see that Postgres mem uh, M map, so kind of a copy and write mapped 142 megabytes. It's, if you know this default 128 plus some memory that Postgres allocates for itself. And then we allocate some uh, 68 byte bytes for anonymous memory, which is basically a pointer to the real, finally, shared memory segment. So pretty much nice and simple, and we can see all this breakdown and understand how much shared memory consumed by Postgres. Another nice example is the dirty pages. So here's a nice diagram. I hope you already know about this, but basically, if we keep something in the memory before writing it, well, because before checkpointing it, and imagine we have some dirty pages here and here, there are sometimes background workers trying to sync them, but in the between, Linux kernel will try to sync them from the file system cache to the storage itself, based on some different parameters. And for us, it's really important for database, for Postgres, it's really important because uh, here we have the situation when write back and suddenly, without Postgres doing anything, cause us a lot of I.O. So yeah, especially yeah, if we see something like that in the kernel Linux, so there is a function called saying reclaim, and with this commentary, when we see that legacy MCG are completely broken and blah, blah, it's a little bit scary, because it means that if you run something on Docker, it means that maybe memory throttling is gonna be a little bit crazy for you. So let's imagine again, now we're smart. Let's deploy a perf to see how does it affect us. So we can deploy the perf, we can see, aha, from time to time, we have this spike. So this is a basically a graph that shows us how much uh, page written we have by recorded via this command. So we're just recording one event called write back written pages. And here we can see that from time to time we've got these spikes that are corresponding to this line. So we're reason because of background reasons, we want to flush everything. We reached our limit, Linux kernel will try to do a lot of IO. Normally it's not a problem because if you have SSD or like NVMe or whatever, you have several queues and you can write to them in parallel, so Postgres will still have some capacity to write. But then it could be even really worse. 
because there is a thing that basically a Linux kernel can inject I/O timeouts to your backends. If write back, if kernel Linux kernel uh, write back is not keep up with the uh, amount of updated dirty pages, it will start to inject delays. Which means literally your backends are getting to be delayed for some amount of time. Which is, of course, not a single person want to have something like that for its own database. And it turns out that it's super complicated to extract this information via perf. So that's why I've created this nice script to extract this information. And here we can see a nice example when we're doing the game PG Bench versus against Postgres. And we can see that in a normal situation, it was like uh, 32 gigabytes of memory or something. We have it not that frequently. But for a huge server, of course, the situation could be much different. And the last example is about Kubernetes. So let's imagine you've like awoken after a huge party with a terrible hangover and you realize that you run your database on Kubernetes. Can happen. And if you know in Kubernetes you have these sections, resources, when you specify requests and limits. Normally, I was expecting that, yeah, of course, those parameters are mapped one to one to C groups. So we have soft limit in bytes and limit in bytes. The problem is that with Kubernetes, nothing that simple. And especially with terms of resources, you have to be aware, for example, that in this case, it turns out that this thingy is not mapped at all to anything in terms of C groups. Basically, this thing is being used by Kubernetes only for its own purposes to define class of service, uh, uh, quality of service class. So, OK, now we have the situation. We don't have soft limit. My theory was, aha, it's good for us. It means that we don't have this problem when we're uh, kind of running out of memory and kernel starts to do some memory reclaim. Because, of course, memory reclaim, it's some time to time, could be rather expensive. Not probably super much, but in the, if you have a lot of memory, it could be. But then I was wrong. And I was wrong, and I could prove it with, again with this approach, with extended BPF script, uh, because there is something called memory pressure, especially memory pressure on C group level. Basically, it says how much um, pressure for the memory from the application side kernel is experiencing right now. And it turns out that if this memory pressure is too high, kernel starts to reclaim pages anyway. And again, it's super hard to extract this information by default, especially on the global level. And that's why we've, I've created this nice script that shows you this information with a really nice uh, metrics here. And at the same time, we have this also super cool thingy. Basically, you can say, please show me this particular metric against this particular container, which is really cool because normally <coughs> such a global metric is hard to collect, and usually people are collecting them only over the whole machine. And yeah, the last part about a bit of infrastructure. So if you want to run, if you want to play with this functionality locally on your laptop, it's super easy. Basically, you need to make sure that you have turned on these parameters in kernel, but normally all the modern, all the modern Linux distribution already have this turned off by default. And you also most likely have by default debugfs turned on. If you want to run it in, in container in your infrastructure, it's already a little bit more complicated. Uh, the problem is, first of all, you have to make sure, if you, even if you're using perf, you need to make sure that you're using correct uh, debug symbols. And you need to probably copy them if you're using Debian, you need to copy them from userlib.debug. And at the same time, you should not forget that you have to run Docker with privileges that allows Docker to run all the commands we need right now to trace them. So usually for perf, it's pretty straightforward. You need to specify only ptrace. But for BPF, unfortunately, it's better just to run it with privilege node. And sometimes it's not that nice because people are trying to avoid this. But it's necessary for this particular case. And the most tricky part was Kubernetes because, again, you have to provide uh, privileges. But this part was really mind-blowing for me because, unfortunately, normally it happens that you have a container you run on Kubernetes and they have different Linux kernel versions. Not significantly, but a little bit. And normally BPF does not work in this case because BPF requires exact match one to one, otherwise something may go wrong. But you can override this by providing this nice environment variable. And the last part is about how to break. Uh, so all I've told you about is like really powerful approach and you can do almost everything you want and you collect all the, all the metrics you want, but at the same time it's super it's careful, scary, because it's something that happens on the low level significantly. And it's super easy to break something. For example, this is an example when I was trying to collect some data about how frequently one particular trigger in Postgres was uh, called with some particular arguments. And I created this uh, user probe, I've run it, and then I've got crashed backend on the real production database because this data was null. Somehow, Perf unfortunately could not resolve this in the memory. Another example is basically it shows you that even such an old and proofed software as a Linux kernel is not without the bugs completely. So here's an example when I was trying to record how frequently we're doing full page writes. And I've created again this user probe. 
And then on the moment of creation, there was a backend perf that basically uh, perf tries to write this uh, user prop into a special file in CSFS. And then it's stuck, and it's stuck not only as a user land process, but it's stuck as a kernel process, which means it's non-interruptible, it's not killable, I, you cannot do anything with it. And it means since we're writing from this particular situation, our Docker container itself was broken and nothing could be changed. And here, fortunately, it was a replica, we just reinitialized it, but yeah, it was scary. And the last example, it's uh, just a screenshot from the BPX, uh, BCC tracker that shows that you can easily get, for example, a kernel panic from using this tool. This one is pretty much old, it's for Ubuntu 4.4, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Ubuntu 8, I don't remember which version, but Linux kernel was 4.4, so it's relatively old and it of course was fixed, but still, if you want to use something like that, you have to be careful and it's nice, another example of this statement. Yeah, and at this point I'm done and I hope you have a lot, a lot of questions. <coughs> Thank you. Do you need those go? So, any questions? <coughs> oh, come on, come on. <laughs> there should be. I, I've told you so much, and I haven't said that all of it is true, so please be careful. <laughs> so, no questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, then, thank you. Okay, thank you.